Do you want to know the Oblates? Discover our life and mission. Join us! Yeah. There's a special request for me to talk about the very urgent concern today, and that is the COVID-19. This talk, I first gave to the clergy of uh, Nova Liches and, uh, and to other groups after that. But let me begin with this very interesting uh, text that I read. Finding your carencia. In a book about Spain, I remember reading an interesting thing about bullfighting. There is a place in the bull ring where the bull feels safe. There is a place in bull where the bull feels safe. If he can reach this place, he stops running and can gather his full strength. He is no longer afraid. From the point of view of his opponent, he becomes dangerous. This place in the ring is different for every bull. It is the job of not the matador to be aware of this, to know where the sanctuary lies for each and every bull, to be sure that the bull does not occupy his place of wholeness. In bullfighting, the safe place is called Carencia. Carencia is an untranslatable Spanish word that means something, approximately something like the art of posing as a place of refuge and renewal. A place where one feels safe, a place from which one is, one's strength of character is drawn, a place where one feels at home, a place where you are your most authentic self. A place in which we know exactly who we are. The place from which we speak our deepest beliefs. A safe haven, lair or sanctuary. It is a place in our inner world. Often it is a familiar place that has not been noticed until a time of crisis. Sometimes, it is a viewpoint, a position from which to conduct a life different for each person. Often, it is simply a place of deep silence. I have seen the change which happens when a person finds his or her carencia. In full view of the matador, he or she is calm and peaceful, wise. The person has gathered his or her strength around him or her. The inner silence is more secure than any hiding place. If you get hold of this book by Rachel Noemi Remen, Kitchen Table Wisdom, it became very, very popular maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, he's a, she's a doctor. She's a doctor and then left his uh, profession as a medical doctor but moved into healing ministry. Okay. It's a nice talk. Now let me begin. This is the talk that I've given to the clergy of, of uh, Novaliches. And I entitled it, Adversity in the Season of COVID-19. So we are familiar with these terms now. You know, we often hear in the newspaper, read in the newspaper, on television, on radio, physical distancing, isolation, illness, death, loss of livelihood and income, they all weigh heavily on all of us. So now, months into the lockdown, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, almost nine months now into the lockdown, it's time to reflect on the experience to make this stressful, painful experience 
meaningful, and transformative. That's the whole point. How can we make this experience meaningful and transformative? And when I say that, I am reminded of Psalm 16, verse 7. We recite this. I thank the Lord who counsels me even at night. He instructs my heart. The first time I encountered it, I was puzzled. What does it mean that God is instructing us at night? At night? Why not at daytime? But that's the point. It means learning the usefulness of one's afflictions and adversity. In other translation, the word is at night, even at night, He educates us. He educates our heart. You know the word education, educare, to make what is crooked straight. That's why you whip the students, yeah? To make them straight, okay? Whip the scholastics to make them straight. Okay, so that's education, okay? Now, you know, a lot of people, like especially doctors, these are doctors from St. Luke, inviting me to move into their group to deal with these stages of what they say, stages of anxiety and distress. I have not said yes because I don't know whether I'm competent to do that. Okay? But they said, it all begins with the physical. The, the physical, you know. I might be contaminated. I might get sick. You know, that's the first reaction of people. And so it creates stress and anxiety. But the second stage is financial. The loss of income. Huh? And the third one, and this is what they're worried about, they said there will be more suicides coming. Because the third stage is mental. And they were asking me to help them on how to deal with this in a sp from the spiritual point of view. Factor that with the lifetime consequences and health effects, even if a vaccine is made available. The vaccine will not stop it. Uh, it will not. You just have to deal with it. The maturity, and this is the education at night, education at night, the maturity of our faith is gauged by how we deal with our present adversity. How do we deal with it? It will be there uh, as we deal with other issues in life. Uh, how do we deal with this? And so questions like, what have we learned so far about ourselves? About life? About our family? About our concerns? About our priorities in life? About the world? About our environment? About our social responsibility? We should have learned something about those issues or areas of life. And in the midst of this dark and distressing situation, we can also ask ourselves, what beautiful things did we witness? Or have we witnessed so far? In ourselves, in our family, in others, in the community, and in the environment, and so on and so forth. For example, there's no doubt we witness a lot of heroic selflessness, what we call frontliners. And then those people who line up to receive their, you know, support, financial support. The capacity to carry unbearable suffering. The capacity, you see this, especially with the poor, the capacity to bear, to carry unbearable suffering. And then there's also the issue of the environment. And I'll play you a, a clip. We fell asleep in one world and woke up in another. Suddenly Disney is out of magic. Paris is no longer romantic. New York doesn't stand up anymore. The Chinese wall is no longer a fortress. And Mecca is empty. Hugs and kisses suddenly become weapons. 
and not visiting parents and friends becomes an act of love. Suddenly you realize that power, beauty and money are worthless and can't get you the oxygen you're fighting for. The world continues its life and it is beautiful. It only puts humans in cages. I think it's sending us a message. You are not necessary. The air, earth, water and sky without you are fine. When you come back, remember that you are my guests, not my masters. came across this passage I think, uh, on the internet. It says, the world risks becoming an inhabitable hell. A warning from the UN. The world risks becoming an uninhabitable hell. Jesus says, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. As a video clip says, it's sending us a message. What is the message? Three signs from nature. We know how to interpret the signs of the sky, but we cannot interpret what's happening. The first sign is climate change. Related to that is the second sign, extinction. More than 28 species of animals and plants are threatened with extinction. And the third sign is COVID-19. Not the first, nor the last. Not the first, nor the last. So what is the call? Change our relationship with nature. Change our relationship with nature. There are three discerning and prayerful questions that we have to ask to make this painful experience, this distressing experience, transformative and meaningful. First, what is the opportunity God is offering us here in this time of pandemic? The opportunity. The second question is, what is God inviting or challenging us in this time of pandemic? And third, what gift is God trying to give us in this situation? Let us not forget the image that Jesus used in one of his parables, the pruning of the branches. If you don't stay joined to me, you will be thrown away. You will be like dry branches that are gathered up and burnt on fire. The sign obviously is suffering is nature's way of improving us. Suffering is nature's way of improving us, making us stronger, making our blossoms, our good works brighter. Suffering makes us more mature, makes us more aware of who we are. In other words, we are guests. We are not masters. And how we are to reshape our future, our responsibility. So what is spirituality in this stage? Ask yourselves now, what are you struggling with right now? Financial, mental distress and depression, loss of income, you know, whatever. This is the area where you are most engaged with God. Because our core struggle is the place where we and God are most vitally engaged. And if that is the case, is spirituality is happening always. Especially in the areas of our life where we are most challenged at any given time. We are most engaged with God. So, 
I always ask this question, what are you praying about? Listen to your prayers. This question is often asked, what is God in all this? Has God abandoned us? Has evil prevailed? Well, God is at our side, grieving with us as anyone who loves us. Remember what Yahweh tells Moses, I have seen the humiliation of my people. I hear their cry when they are cruelly treated. I know their suffering. Look at those verbs. To see, to hear, and to know. And second, in other words, God is very much aware and is engaged. Second, God does not send us pain and suffering but works with us in them for good. God does not send us out. Evil does not come from God. Suffering does not come from God. But He assures us that something good will come out of it. Third, God will bring forth all possible good from the evils we suffer. Evil and suffering do not come from God. Something good will always come out of the bleakest situation. Because pain opens deep recesses inside our being and makes us aware that without pain, nothing new can ever be born. From Rollheiser, the way to happiness according to Tolstoy is often through pain. Now, why does God allow us to suffer? Saint Ignatius has some wisdom to share with us. When he said these three reasons why God allows us to suffer, he was referring to our struggle in prayer. But you can apply those three reasons in every aspect of our life. He says, we have become neglectful. And I think that's very, very easy to understand. We consider ourselves masters rather than guests of this world and abused it. We neglected our responsibility. Third, to make us realize that everything is a gift. We don't own the world, the earth, nature, the trees and the birds. Everything is a gift. We have no right to abuse our environment and third to test our love our perseverance and stamina in going through this painful night so what is the basis of our hope the basis of our hope is this god has the last word life not death has the last word Blessing, not curse, has the last word. That's the basis of our hope. Third, God is calling all of us to change the conditions that produce these evils. What is our role, for example, in the issue of climate change and environment? We have to make changes. You know, what we are doing here at OMC and what Ponpon -Pon is doing in Grace Park is hypo, what's it called? <laughs> Whatever hypo, okay. So, <laughs> it's our way of contributing. This is our responsibility to contribute a little in change because this is change. What we are doing is, is change. What changes should we make in our life and in our world, even in our life? Why? Because life cannot be the same after the season of COVID-19. It cannot be business as usual. We are asked to choose. Choose. Life as usual? Or you want a better life? So if we choose a better life, then we have to imagine what it would be. What would be a better life for you? and for us. 
So again, I go back to what I said at the beginning. How do we make this experience transformative and meaningful? Three things that we have to look into and meditate. Years from now, I don't know when we'll be get over this situation. And when we look back, we will be telling stories. A lot of stories to tell. And there are three elements in the stories that we will tell. What work did we offer? Or what work did we do during the time of crisis? Second, the love that we shared and the love that we gave. And third, the ability, the courage we displayed in the face of suffering. These three things will have to be the content of whatever story we share years from now. So during this time of pandemic, what work have you done or what work are you doing? To whom did you show your love? Or to whom are you showing your love? How did you display your courage? Or how are you displaying your courage? These are the questions we have to ponder. If we are to make this situation, this pandemic experience, meaningful and transformative.